Friday evening, every passport stamp. We are joined by a traveler that uh, many of us greatly admire, Francis Tapon. Welcome. Hi, how are you, Seth? So I think we can try to explain to the, the world what is essentially uh, being regarded as a new U.S. holiday. And I, I uh, consider myself quite ignorant in, in this respect because I started getting announcements like for my bank that says our branches will be closed for Juneteenth. And I've spent the past few days reading about the history. And I think the audience around the world might be even more curious about what, what, what is this, this new observance being formed. That's interesting. Yeah, because I remember I went to my Google Calendar this morning. I saw Juneteenth like highlighted as if it was a holiday. And I was like, huh. I, did, I mean, I, entered, I looked at it. And I was like, OK, I don't know. And I did just pass my and didn't catch the news that actually that's official now. Really? They passed a oh. law just like. Well, I mean, some area. I mean, it, it's becoming in that sense. As I said, businesses okay. started observing it this year. And I think even some localities have uh, are looking at recognizing it. But yeah, it's not a, it's not a federal holiday. Okay, got it. It's not like uh, Martin Luther King. I remember when Martin Luther King became a holiday because I was alive at that time. You know, I, when I was a kid, we, it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, we got a free extra day. Woohoo! <laughs> My school was the the point of his legacy was interpreted as you have to go to school and study and not not oh. have a free day off. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a different. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So tell us about Juneteenth. Tell us about America. I'm going to share some uh, some links from your your podcast where you talked about the uh, the the political turmoil we're going through, protests, riots, all of that. You're uh, a keen observer of of American culture as as well as of the world. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to say. I mean, I think actually what what I have to say is actually less interesting than what my wife has to say. My wife is from Cameroon. And she came here about two years ago. Mm. And for her, it's such a fascinating experience. And I find it fun to just look at her world through her perspective because it's so different than what the typical American is. She comes from Africa. She grew up in Nigeria, surrounded by Boko Haram. Mm. Um, because she, uh, and so it, for her, it's, it's fascinating. So what we're doing is now on my Facebook profile, as well as on my website, I'm putting up some short little videos of mm. her reflections on these riots and, and things like that and all the turmoil that has recently been going on. And, you know, it's, it's, I think her, her perspective is, is quite fascinating. And actually right as at the end of this conversation, we're going to air a brand new video. It's only about four minutes where she talks mm. about policing in America versus policing mm. in Africa. Fantastic. So I will share the, the blog link. And when the video gets up, I will share that link as well. And uh, I've got it here. So I'm putting it into the comments and everybody absolutely do check that out right after right after we finish this conversation. And that uh, um, you've got a series actually on your website, which I'm also going to link to about defending America. And oh, yeah. <laughs> how would you? Uh, it's a five part series. It's every post has its own take. And I'm I'm curious how you would how you would revisit that uh, in light of the events of the past few weeks. Yeah, it's, it's it's a very interesting question. Now, just for those who don't know me, and a lot, most people I assume don't, um, I was born and raised in San Francisco, and it's perhaps the most liberal town in uh, the United States, maybe Portland, but but certainly one of the most liberal towns. And so I am used to the typical very liberal comments. And so when I say defending America, and I just know some people are just going to just jump on me. What are you talking about defending America? We're the worst country ever. <laughs> we <laughs> suck. Don't you know that? <laughs> um, and then I all, you know, I just like, it's like as if I'm waving a Trump banner, like, you know, yeah, I want him. He's the best president ever. So, um, so just set some expectations. I wrote a book about Eastern Europe. Well, for, okay, even go, take a step back. I'm not, I'm a first generation American. My father was from France. My mom is from Chile. Mm -hmm. And I went to a French school for 12 years. So in many ways, I'm barely American in that, mm -hmm. in that respect. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me. I just think that Americans have a tendency to criticize themselves quite a bit. Mm. <clears throat> and that's good. I think that's healthy. And that's what makes us better. And that's what made, made our country strong. Mm -hmm. And but sometimes and, and Europeans pile on it. I think it's the, the whole idea that we'd like to cheer for the underdog. 
And for the last 60, 70 years, America has been not the underdog. It's the exact opposite. So we kind of all like to cheer uh, for the other side to be a little bit contrary in that sense. But I think sometimes I like to take a step back. So I wrote my book about Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And Eastern Europe, I talked about the, the things that we can learn from Eastern Europeans. It's called the Hidden Europe, what Eastern Europeans can teach us. And in the process of writing that book, I spent three and a half years in Eastern Europe trying to learn what Eastern Europeans do better than Americans. Mm -hmm. And in the process of doing that, Eastern Europeans and Europeans in general critiqued America constantly. They mm -hmm. suck at this. We suck at that. We <laughs> suck at this. We, we're ignorant. We're geographically incompetent. We have no culture. Uh, the CIA controls everything. Uh, our foreign policy is horrendous. And so I was like, you know what? Hold on here. I need to defend this poor little country for just a little bit and just make some five points that were commonly raised by Europeans and how I want to defend it. And the most popular one is defending American ignorance. That mm -hmm. if you search defending, you know, if you search for American ignorance on Google, it's one of the top 10 articles. <laughs> so what we how do you defend American ignorance? I have put the link in the uh, the show notes so people can see the full argument. But uh, yeah, I've never, I've never had a good answer other than <laughs> that, that knowing uh, smile and laugh. <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah, I have to defend the American smile too. That's that's number three. So it's uh, defending American foreign policy, defending the CIA, defending the American smile, defending American ignorance, and defending American culture. Those are the five things. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a tough road I had to do. But anyway, to defend American ignorance, the most popular uh, article that everybody likes to go to, um, try to succinctly put it, I think human beings are geographically focused. So we, have a, we tend to look at the, the world, we tend to know a 500 kilometer radius, radius around us mm -hmm. fairly well. Mm -hmm. And we tend to be, a, we get weaker and weaker on average, the further out we go. And so in Europe, because the countries are relatively small and Europe is roughly the size of the uh, contiguous United States, mm -hmm. a 500 kilometer radius, I mean, you cover several countries in there. And so that alone, and of course, several languages, several cultures, et cetera. But if you're in Kansas, a 500 kilometer culture, you're still deep in America. Mm -hmm. So as a result, if you go to countries that are big, like China or Russia, um, they tend to be somewhat ignorant of of beyond their things and europeans know a lot of languages but not because they're just so bright and amazing and worldly it's just that they have to you know if you're slovenian you have to learn two or three languages mm -hmm. you're just not going to get by with slovenian alone mm -hmm. and uh, the other error that is commonly made is that a well a cultured european who's world traveler will often compare himself uh, compare that to the american on the street or they'll mm -hmm. watch YouTube videos about the American on the street who doesn't know where his ass is. <laughs> and so and they're like, how can he, they don't even know where Iraq is and they're attacking Iraq and things like that. <laughs> I'm like, but you have to compare the educated American with the educated European. And you'll uh -huh. see the divergence is not that dramatic. It is. And lastly, uh, if you compare the, the average American on the street with the average European on the street, again, the difference is not that dramatic. But oftentimes mm -hmm. we're comparing apples and oranges. Uh, 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 educated guy versus uneducated person, and then it's it's just an unfair comparison. So those are some of the things. But read the article, and you'll you'll see a little bit more breakdown. That's a teaser. Right, now that five hundred kilometer thing, I'm thinking it it runs up against a, a personal travel rule I've had, which is to never ask anybody about travel tips or advice or the situation in the neighboring country. Oh yeah. <laughs> It's always bad. <laughs> Don't go there. You're going to yeah. die. <laughs> I mean, I was in, uh, I was an exchange student in Hong Kong going to Macau for the weekend. And my, my roommate said uh, they were going to inject me with AIDS filled needles and then harvest my organs. Um, and it was like, you know, kids going to school and in ornate gardens in Macau. <laughs> and they do that in Canada. I yeah. swear. <laughs> So uh, you've, you've had more systematic travels than I've had. So can you ask the next country over for planning advice or how far do you have to get away to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. to get the advice? Yeah. yeah, no, it's fascinating. But I, I will say another kind of a generality that I find. When, you're, when I was in Europe, in general, Europeans disliked their neighboring country on mm -hmm. average. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that's certainly true in Hungary. Hungary has, I think, about seven neighbors, and they dislike at least five of them. Um, and Greece dislikes all their neighbors, the Albanians. They don't like the Turks. They don't like the Macedonians. I mean, they're into enemies with everybody. Uh, so versus in Africa, I thought it was kind of interesting that after visiting all 54 African countries, most Africans, I would ask them about their neighbors, expecting that they would say, oh, yeah, they suck, just like the Europeans. But actually, on average, they're like, yeah, yeah, we like them. Hmm. Huh. You go to Niger and you ask them about the Nigerians. Oh, yeah, they're cool. And, you know, like, what about the guys from Burkina Faso, the Burkina Bay? Oh, yeah, they're good, too. <laughs> now, granted, they don't have a whole lot of experience because they may not travel as much. And, the, sure, and, yeah. and, and some of the African countries are enormous. So, again, that 500 mile, 500 kilometer radius is, is pretty significant when you when you're in a country the size of uh, Sudan. And in uh, in Eastern Europe, and I've I've traveled to all of the countries you cover in the hidden Europe, but nowhere near the the depth of uh, experience you have uh, of, of food wise. We have a lot of foodie type listeners. Uh, Albania was the one that really surprised me. As I like hearty dishes, so that's a bit of a bias for me. But okay, the the influences of Italian and, and a lot of other stuff that that I didn't expect. Uh, is that a is that a pick for you or what which which of the food cultures really grabbed you? Well, I love Italian food culture. I mean, but food is I think a more general comment. What I find fascinating is that no matter I mean, this is perhaps very super obvious, of course, but almost no matter where you go, no matter how much the food sucks in your mm -hmm. opinion of that country, everybody who's local thinks their food is like some of the best food in the country. Mm. Uh, very rare. Like I met this Austrian guy who is just who really thinks German food is terrible and Germanic food, should I say, and he really uh, prefers more spicy food and that kind of stuff. Mm. But so many times I just find it fascinating the how people are so attached to the food. I'll give you an example. Again, my wife, she's from Cameroon mm -hmm. and she, I mean, has an orgasm when she gets her food from Nigeria or from Cameroon. Mm. It, you know, touching the fufu, which is that kind of uh, mushy uh, thing that you grab with your hands and you dip it into some sort of crazy sauce. Mm -hmm. I think it's good, but I'm like, it's not orgasm worthy <laughs> in my opinion. But for her, it's just like, wow. And she's like, I'm so glad all the African restaurants are far away from us because otherwise I'd be spending a fortune going to them. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> but you know, to me, it's, it's nothing special. I tend to like uh, Thai and Indian food the most. But and those are two countries have you not been to? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's another thing that I remember. I lived with a woman from China and another one from Taiwan. And they said, like, the Chinese food in America has nothing to do with the Chinese food in China. I'm like, okay, I am just can't, can't wait to go there. But I'm, I'm sure that's another example of Freud's narcissism of tiny, slight differences. Uh, there's bigger. I mean, it's because it, there's such regional differences that that draw on it. And I lived in China for a decade, and uh, so that's if if there's one food area I know a little bit about, it's that. And say where I am in Seattle, it's a lot of uh, uh, students at the University of Washington are in recent years coming from areas in in more northern China, Beijing area, Hebei, mm -hmm. these areas, and so a lot of restaurants have opened up serving their food, which is radically different than then certainly you would get in typical Chinese restaurants just because the, the chefs and, and the history of the restaurants in the U.S. came from the South and the Southwest. Uh, right. So they, they wouldn't even, they don't even think to try some of these dishes. It's just not, not part of their vocabulary. And I would love, to, I can't wait to go to China because I, I'm so curious because so many Chinese people, natives, have said to me, the Chinese food in America, and I've tried so much of it, has nothing to do with it. I just don't think that my palate is going to mm -hmm. be you know, catch the subtlety, which I think is going to be salty, but I could be completely wrong. I get there, I'm like, of course, this is completely different. And of course, like you said, the, I mean, China's a huge country and there's so many different varieties there in China. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, foreign visitors to China end up getting disappointed by the food because the Chinese they're with, especially if it's a business context, will take them out to very nice restaurants. Like McDonald's? Spirit. No, no, I mean, I really... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as, as a joke, but I mean, they'll, they'll order delicacies to them, which might be based on texture or in, right. in Shanghai, that region, uh, uh, more mild flavors. And the stuff that their, their foreign guests would actually really love is the stuff that the Chinese hosts are going home at night and filling up on uh, and enjoying. Or, or like I said, in, in Seattle now, we're getting these bold 
flavors like from Xi'an, the, the cumin flavored meats, the Silk Road flavors, which are very, very different and uh, and, and some of my favorites. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be looking to see. I, I feel like I, I started my travels in Asia and it's been a little bit of downhill in some ways since because so many of my favorites have been in Asia. So I, I feel like you're, you're building up the right way because you've, you've extensively traveled, I think what pretty much every inhabited continent in, except Asia and Asia, you really, you're systematic to the degree that are, are there any countries in Asia that you have visited? Uh, I think about three or something like that. Uh, hello, this is Kobe, by the way, for those who are watching this. Um, Kobe is a excited dog here. But uh, yeah, I've been to um, Korea, a couple of, South Korea a couple of mm -hmm. times, and I went to Singapore and um, Malaysia, a very tiny bit of Malaysia. And I think that's about, oh, and Japan three times. So you have you have you have a few visits on, under your belt and uh, yeah, but yeah. when you see it on the map, it doesn't look like anything. Yeah, you see this vast emptiness in all of Asia. Yeah, so well, we, you you do not have a vast Ooh. emptiness in Africa, and uh, <laughs> I, I think everybody in the group listens to Counting Countries podcast with Rick Kazarian, where you talked about you talked about what would I think often be considered the most. Uh, extreme travel destinations in, in terms of challenge and that and and didn't really cover any of the ones that a lot of tourists visit and and so I'm I'm, I'm thinking that uh, you know what, what what did you think of Kenya or Tanzania because he, he didn't ask any he didn't ask any of the the normal or the media that people are experiencing yeah it's true yeah um yeah, I suppose it makes sense because obviously you have so many people who've been to Kenya and Tanzania. I mean, I do have a business in, in Tanzania, so I do have a fair amount of experience there. Um, I think it also makes a big difference whether you're I was talking to somebody um, and, you know, Kenya, obviously, it's just like just like in the United States or any country, really. I mean, there's a huge difference between the capital city and most of the rest of the country. It's very common. Moscow is not like Russia, New York, which is not the capital, but, you know, it's a big city. Is very different than much of America, and and same thing with Nairobi and many African uh, countries. So, so it's I always try to make an effort. Any country I go to is to try to see three things: the capital, or at least their biggest city; mm -hmm. two, a smaller town; and three, the wilderness or some sort of nature. Mm -hmm. You know, if I think if you do those three things, if you can, then at least you get a little bit better nuance of of the country. And Africa is one that I think a, a lot of tourists end up only going to the three, the number three, the the wilderness or the the animals. They they may not visit any city. Uh, right. They may fly only, into it. Yeah, or only incidentally experience the culture in the context of a safari. So let, let, let's have a non-safari uh, visit of Africa in terms of cities, whether they're they're medium size or even the capitals that. That say like a, the, the the stereotypical digital nomad, you'd actually say, yeah, go spend a month there, and and uh, you would enjoy it. It'd be really rewarding. Yeah, and and it and it is. I think that the number one thing that often is the the biggest misconception I would say is safety issue. And most cities uh, in Africa, well, just like most American cities, there's a zone that might be a little bit dangerous, or maybe you m may not want to go out at night as much, mm -hmm. but by far and away, it's very safe. And so that's mm -hmm. one thing that I think can put a lot of people at ease. And certainly in the villages and the countryside, even more safe. So in general, you know, I picked up 3,000 hitchhikers in Africa and never had a really a bad instance. Only when my wife was driving, riding along twice, somebody tried to pull her, pick her purse mm. in the backseat, but nothing like violent or anything like that. So Africa is extremely safe. And so in that sense, I think it's a great place for digital no nomad or anybody really. Mm -hmm. And are there any of the cities that that really say? I feel like so many of the cities are just blanket said. Don't go to. Don't visit any of the cities. I, I'm thinking like say Constantine in Algeria, one of the coolest cities I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. Windhoek, Namibia. I mean, there, there's a lot of. Yeah. Uh, I guess they're all hidden gems because they're not very well known in the world. <laughs> right. Right. Which, which ones really jumped out? Yeah. Well, I, I will say this: that it it is true that. The problem is this, is that many people who have traveled internationally have been to cities like, let's say, Tokyo or any, practically any European city. Mm -hmm. And European cities are just such beautiful gems mm -hmm. in general. It's mm -hmm. hard to find a bad European city. Mm -hmm. And 
so we, when you come in with that mindset and then you graduate to, to go to Africa, almost always you're going to be disappointed because mm. the African cities just cannot compete at that level. There's mm. more trash on the street. Um, there's the traffic is usually worse. The, the infrastructure, they don't have subways. Except for me, I think South Africa is the only one. Maybe I think, I think that's the only one. Uh, there's probably some in North Africa, um, but in general, infrastructure, you name it. Uh, so that's, I think, why uh, why African often Af African cities often get uh, you know some bad reviews. Mm -hmm. However, if you ask me where are some nice ones, I mean, I do think places like, of course, in North Africa, you got lots of them. Algiers, which is the capital of Algeria, is spectacular. It's very mm -hmm. nice, very clean. Um, and so is um, some other, I didn't get to go to any of the big cities in Libya. I only went to Southern Libya. Um, and in the Sub-Sahara, I would probably, the first thing that came into mind is Liberia. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, did I say Liberia? I meant- um, Monrovia? In Liberia? Uh, Gabon, Gabon, oh, Gabon. Liberville. 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 Yeah. And that's also quite a nice, uh, quite a nice town. But again, relative, you know, somebody's going to go to Liberville on the next flight and he's going to say, Francis, you're completely wrong. It doesn't compare to Prague. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> it, it, it does look a bit like a Jean-Luc Godard film set from the 70s that's been, been left to, to, to sit there in uh, Abidjan, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, I think is really cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah. It, uh... Uh, talk a little bit about West Africa, because that's one that, uh, setting aside the current uh, virus travel situation, uh, a, a number of new flights, accessibility, nonstop Newark to Lome, uh, Togo, for instance, have opened up, and West Africa has become accessible from a visa perspective, uh, from a flight perspective, much more in the past few years. And it it's one that I, when travelers are, say, asking more veteran travelers for advice, they often say, oh, that one last, you know, you know, just, but, but it's actually, I mean, I, I feel like plopping down in, uh, in, a, in a city like Lome is actually quite accessible now and, and, uh, and quite manageable. So West Africa, you, you can define it how you will from, uh, I guess, Senegal down, down to uh, the border of Nigeria. Yeah, exactly. No, it is a definitely still a tough area, I think, to go to. It's certainly uh, that and middle Africa are the, I think, the most challenging parts for the typical person, traveler, tourist, whatever, to go into. Because part of it is just the infrastructure is really crappy. There's a lot of muddy roads. And if you're going there in the rainy season, it's very tough. I drove there and it was very hard. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of the challenge. But again, I think that people who are planning to go to West Africa are typically, they've already got like 10 to, to 100 countries under their belt. Mm -hmm. And they're wanting something that's a bit different. And they've, you know, after a while, as you know, there's kind of like a commoditization of, of, of stuff. And all of a sudden, Singapore kind of looks like Manhattan. And, mm -hmm. you know, everything looks the same after a while. So they're kind of like, can I get something new and something cool and different? And then all of a sudden, West Africa comes in the picture. And that's going to be different in many respects. And so I think it's, it's definitely worth it. And um, the big challenge, I would say, is the, the most... The biggest challenge is, is visas. And as you correctly said, it is getting better, mm -hmm. but definitely do your research on visas before going because it is the biggest headache in general in Africa and certainly West and Middle Africa. And speak to the mechanics of, I mean, visas on arrival at airports is, is where things typically liberalize, but you're, you're bringing a vehicle across a border, which in just about any part of the world is a non-trivial thing, yet I feel like... Mm -hmm. The times I've I've done it in some limited way, like Belize to Guatemala. I mean, just getting through the notarized paperwork and all that for for a normal touristed route was it's the most memorable part of my trip. So it's probably <laughs> worth worth doing that, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I didn't even have a carnet de passage. Carnet de passage is this kind of document that's internationally recognized yeah. that allows your you to cross borders relatively easy i didn't even have that and i was going mm -hmm. and i started in morocco headed south to go through west africa and you're absolutely right it is it it creates a an added layer of complication and expense and just delays etc it usually took me several hours to go across almost any border i almost never did it in less than an hour ever um the i think the longest time it took is like maybe nine hours to cross mm -hmm. the border wow. um west africa is, west africa is tough and then sometimes to getting visas, I, I had to wait on one month 
to get a visa for Chad. Um, I think a couple of weeks for Niger. Um, so again, just plan ahead that one, I don't know if Ghana has changed their policy, but at the time you couldn't get visa on the go, if you will. You can't like land in, I don't know, Lome in Togo and then get your visa for uh, Ghana. Uh, you have to get it from your home country, wherever your home country, your home embassy. So I got it because there was somehow I got a tip that in Dakar, capital mm -hmm. Senegal, you could, the embassy of Ghana is more lenient and mm -hmm. they will issue visas. And that's exactly what I did. So things like that, but it's, it's a tricky situation, but overall um, I love it just because it's off the beaten track. And I think the experienced traveler gets high off of things that are off the beaten track. Way off the beaten track. I felt like Guinea Bissau could be the, the ecotourism destination and I don't know, 20 or 30 years. But my visit was uh, quite short uh, due to other things. What, what was your experience there? Yeah, I was there for a couple of weeks. It was, I had some technical complicated things that were keeping me in Bissau, the capital, mm -hmm. but I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that along with Sierra Leone should become the surfing capital in a hundred years or less. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's certainly undiscovered stuff out there. The archipelago that, that Guinea-Bissau has is enormous. I think, I can't remember, don't quote me on this. I think it's 150 islands mm -hmm. that they have. And Instead, they're known for trafficking drugs because they have all these wonderful islands mm -hmm. it's impossible to police. And so therefore, it's a wonderful place to, to land your airplane and refuel and, and go on your next uh, trip to Europe and, and take your drugs there. But it's unfortunate because overall, it's, you know, it's pretty nice. And, and for so many people that will only touch foot in uh, Lagos, and fly back out and never return to Nigeria. <laughs> yeah, I drove across Southern Nigeria. I did not get to go, unfortunately, to Northern Nigeria. I spent four months in Niger. So mm -hmm. I kind of have a feeling about how Northern Nigeria might have been because it's also kind of similar climate. It's also a very Muslim culture. Um, but yeah, I mean, Nigeria has got 200 million people. Mm -hmm. And in probably about 50 years, it's gonna pass the United States in population. And so it's it's going to be it's 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 important that we understand these countries that are going to have a larger and larger impact on the global scene. And Nigeria is certainly no exception. Talk about a misunderstood country. Ah! <laughs> what what's one way we could start reframing our understanding of Nigeria? Is it is there an entry through the movies, the music, the? Yeah, I, I, yeah, certainly, and that that's that's a. Good place to start, and they and and Nigeria produces. I don't know if it's still true, but they produce more films than Hollywood uh, through their you know uh, their it's low budget films in general. Although that's changing, and also I think there was a, I can't remember her name because it's kind of complicated. But uh, uh, she said the danger of a single story. Uh, she did a TED talk. She's a Nigerian mm -hmm. author, um, and somebody on the comments will tell me how to spell her name. It's Chimawe. Anyway, I'm not going to try. But, it, but I love the message. I've seen her TED Talk twice. And it's basically, there's a danger of having a single story. It doesn't mean the single story is wrong. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean that there's not a lot of Nigerian scammers because there are a lot of Nigerian scammers, believe me. But it's not just that. That's the danger of a single story. You know, Nigeria and its reputation uh, is, yes, they deserve some of that negative stereotypes that they get. But but that's not all they've got. They've got a lot of other stuff. And same thing with any country. But Nigeria has definitely a black eye for for that stuff, and that's unfortunate for it. Yeah, and I was thinking your comments about the getting needing to go home country for visas as the default model, and it is it's an interesting thing to experience a number of these countries where they're much more connected to say a former colonial power in in Europe. Than, than their neighboring country and how that shifts, like you said, the understanding people have of their neighbors and the travel and trade routes. It's, it's so different from say a model of like Europe or US where you would think you're, you're doing the most communication and trade with, with your next door guy, not, not a seven hour flight away. Right, totally. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, a different, it's a different part of the world. But I think it's fascinating at some, I think that Luckily, uh, people are making more and more an effort to go out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, what what is race, the experience of uh, traveling every country in Africa, where you have people that 
are truly all colors and you know so many different nationalities, ethnicities, former colonial places. Has what what have you learned about race relations that, that maybe informs how you're seeing the U.S. and and what you think about our our, our future in in the U.S. Okay, so let's uh, narrow that down a little bit. So you're saying race relations in Africa, or yeah, yeah. I mean th th this this deep experience uh, traveling in Africa. You're in in many cases you're you're the only we'll, we'll call you a white guy. You're the only white guy in uh, you know for weeks and weeks where you're seeing people that that are are uh, black or a very different culture than you. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I've, I've, op I've felt uh, as an example that like doing business in South Africa, talking with a lot of my colleagues that uh, um, they've talked about how they're lamenting the way their teenage children feel like they, they don't know that much about apartheid, that they feel like mm -hmm. you know, the many problems in the country, they feel like they've, they've somewhat effectively dealt with that era in terms of the reconciliation process. Whereas in the US we're, we never really have any kind of reconciliation, it seems, and and these issues that are bubbling up now uh, so violently are are ones that there's never been a, certainly not a formal process to say how do we get through this. Right. No, it's certainly uh, true. Although I I experienced a little bit different thing than you in South Africa. I found that I felt that even the youth were still quite attached, engaged to their history of apartheid mm. and how that still has some effects and some serious effects on society today. So it's interesting that you felt the opposite. That the I guess I'm, I'm dealing with their parents who are going to naturally right. going to feel a different thing than the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Right, 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 right. But yeah. I, certainly I, I was actually uh, uh, surprised by how, you know, anyway, but I don't know if surprise mm -hmm. is the right word, but anyway, here's a, first of all, South Africa, is a completely different animal than the rest of the continent. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can compare it to Zimbabwe, maybe a little bit to Namibia as far as racial relations and racial stuff, but really it's in its own category mm -hmm. <clears throat> because it is certainly the most racist uh, uh, country in Africa. In this, and I, I mean that on all sides of the fence. In other words, racist whites and racist blacks, blacks mm -hmm. who don't like whites and whites who don't like blacks and everything and everything in between. Versus the rest of the Sub-Sahara, where there is reverse racism on a grand scale. Mm. And reverse racism is often, I think, miscategorized as a black person treating a white person badly. Mm. But I call that racism. <laughs> because when you're judging somebody or mistreating somebody just based on the race, that's <laughs> racism. <laughs> and reverse racism, what I define it as, is when you think another race is better than your race. And that's what you see oftentimes in Africa, where people will roll out the red carpets. People will give me the benefit of the doubt. People will let me get away with murder because I'm white. Mm. And the blacks in Africa oftentimes have a low opinion of themselves mm. and a very high opinion of white people. And that is what I call reverse racism mm. in the sense so, and that is very prevalent. So many things happen. I'll just give you one example. My mm -hmm. wife, who's from Cameroon and she's black, she went to a uh, to the Kenyan embassy and she was trying to get a visa to Tanzania. Mm -hmm. And she, she, we went there together, but I sat, sat down quickly at the couch nearby. Mm -hmm. And she went to the counter and mm -hmm. she had, and then the guy was asking him a, her a bombarding her with a bunch of questions. Where are you going? What are you staying? You know, where's the money? Da, 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 da. And just and finally I was just kind of exasperated, just sitting there, like, why is this taking so long? So I just got up and sat next to her. And I'm like, you know, said, hey, what's money? What's going on? And then the guy looked at me and, and, and looked at her and says, Who is this guy? And she mm -hmm. says, She's my he's my husband. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Come here on Thursday. You can pick it up. <laughs> and things like that happen often where it's just like, you could see that I could get, and, I, and lots of times I could just stroll into any hotel, a five-star hotel, and nobody is gonna stop me. Nobody is gonna dare stop me. And I'll mm -hmm. just waltz in. I'm not staying at that hotel, I'm just walking yeah. in. Yeah. But if Rejoice, or my wife, his name is Rejoice, or any person, black person, just decides to just walk in through the front door of an exclusive, super mm -hmm. great resort, pop, stop you. What are you doing here? Show me your papers. What do you da, 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 da. Anyway, on and on and on. So that's one of the fascinating things uh, and depressing things that I saw in Africa. 
Yeah, the, I think a lot of uh, travelers don't necessarily think of Africa as having island countries, but there are island countries. So to speak about it, we've got Sao Tome and Princip, uh, Cabo Verde on the other side, Madagascar. And then if you want to uh, head to the uh, Indian Ocean Islands broadly, uh, <laughs> speak to them as, as tourist destinations. A few of them, a lot of the writing says like, oh, it's a birder's paradise, which usually seems to be a uh, travel writer shorthand for there was nothing else I could think of saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's seven, seven island nations in Africa. And I was, I really admire, there's a couple of travelers, I'm sure you know them, who have tried, or one of them is attempting, his name is Story, to yeah. go to all the, the countries without flying. And I really admire those people. The other one's Graham Hughes. And mm. because I really wanted to take a boat out to those island nations. And mm. it's really not easy it's, mm. it's and it's probably not that cheap either in some cases but um i remember i was in comoros and i stayed there for like two three weeks waiting to try to get a boat to tanzania because i didn't want to spend 350 dollars on this little flight that goes into dar salaam but in the end that's what i had to do not that i had to but that's you know my eventually my visa is going to run out i just like anyway so that's one of the logistical things going to those island nations and uh but I think that, you know, the typical stereotype, they are islands. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you have these kind of fascinating little, you know, Darwinian experiments going on. And, and you have Madagascar, which some people call the eighth continent because mm -hmm. it's got such biodiversity that doesn't exist anywhere else. you got a place like the Seychelles mm -hmm. or Mauritius, which are little paradises, even though they're officially on the African continent. And uh, then you have, uh, you know, Cape Verde, which has this blend of Portuguese and culture that kind of makes you feel like am i still in africa or not really and anyway and and sao tome you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. and then you have equatorial guinea which is the highest gdp per capita of all and the hardest place to get a visa if you're not an american mm -hmm. british people french any european or australian has a really hard time getting a visa to the Equator equatorial guinea mm -hmm. um and part of it's because of the oil and they just lucked out they have a low population rate so mm -hmm. they got a lot of oil vis-a-vis -vis their population so they became fabulously rich on a average level <laughs> gdp per capita fascinating and uh, we'll, we'll depart from africa for the, the purposes of this conversation and uh i mentioned the the counting country series and if i'm i'm thinking trying to think systematically people that are going to every country in the world they always seem to mention latin america so central america south america last or or not at all and it's a like, if you, if you bring it up, they'll say, oh, I love this, I love that, but it never seems to be the one that leaps out for any of those favorites or this or that. So, I mean, you have, you have family background as, as well as travel, so I don't know how to address that, but uh, how to get it top of uh, top of the answer? What are some of the moments that, that would push it there? Um, yeah, so my mom is from Chile, and I worked in Caracas, Venezuela, for like four months, and I visited maybe about half, actually more than half of, yeah, more than half of the Latin American countries. I've been to, I took a trip that went from Mexico all the way down to Panama mm -hmm. uh, over land. And then, uh, yeah, so I got a, a good sensation of it, but it's fascinating. I had never thought about what you just mentioned there, Stephanie, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of like, yeah, that maybe people just don't think, maybe it's just not exotic enough, you know, mm -hmm. especially for Americans, because it's kind of like you have a lot of Hispanics and Latinos who are running around America. So versus, you know, going to places a little bit more exotic, like Southeast Asia, you know, uh, totally different alphabet and, and, you know, food, which is, you know, you can't find as easily, maybe. I don't know what it is. And certainly Africa stands out differently. And the Middle East kind of feels spooky and scary. And mm -hmm. Latin America, I guess, is just there. And of course, Europeans, stuff like that. So I would say the first thing that comes to mind is the people now the reason and everybody says that about you know oh the people are great and all that yeah. kind of stuff but i'm saying this factually this is supported by gallup polls okay. what gallup has done a study and asked people how happy are you how often do you laugh per day and latin america time and in fact most of the americas that includes canada and, and the united states but certainly latin america always always tops the polls mm. it is one of the happiest friendliest countries based on scientific research by Gallup. And, and, and I think if there's one thing that you could say about that, uh, country, that, that continent, it's that. It's that the people, I think, 
everybody loves to say the people are great. We love the people and all this stuff. You know, it's very cliche. Um, but I think that if you had to pick one region in the world where really the people are top, 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 as far as the friendliness and as far as outgoingness and happy and laughing and, and just joie de vivre, it's Latin America. And you mentioned living in Caracas. That uh, I, I was there about a decade ago, and I, I feel like that was one of the coolest cities I've seen in the Americas. And yeah, uh, yeah, it has the Avila, which is a nice mountain top there, and the weather is pretty uh, uh, decent. And they have a nice subway system. Uh, I worked at the Parque Cristal, which is a nice place to build. But I haven't been there in many years, so mm -hmm. I know it's really gone downhill. Uh, and and the funny thing is, when I was there, and this was back in the like the nineties. Uh, they were saying it's never been so bad. <laughs> of course, I'm sure they would just wish that they could have the 90s back. <laughs> but at the time, they were like, this is the worst it's ever been. You know, we were booming because they were booming in the 70s when the oil prices shot up the roof. And so they were living like kings. They even when I was there, they had get this. They had somebody in the elevator just to push the button for you. So you would get into the elevator and you would say floor five and mm -hmm. her job, she sat there in a chair and she goes four five. Okay. Five. And she pushes <laughs> it for That's her job. And that was a holdover from the seventies when they were just swimming in cash and they didn't know what to do. And they just wanted to give full employment to everybody. So they just made up these silly, stupid jobs that uh, still, some of them still exist. At least when I was there, and I'm sure now they, they probably have people pulling the elevator up because they ran out of electricity. <laughs> Uh, even though they have all this oil <laughs> uh, deny from Cuba she's asking about uh, so you uh, uh, you you got to almost all of the highest peaks in Africa yeah uh, two country was it three countries short or four countries short four, four countries short um, she's wondering if you if you've taken that on for any other countries or continents or if you're going to uh, do so no I'm not um, I think Europe is relatively doable. I did climb the tallest mountain in Europe, uh, Western Europe, should I say. Um, that's uh, Mont Blanc. I did that uh, just uh, as a solo 48-hour uh, tr crazy trip that I don't recommend ever doing. Um, the tallest mountain of Europe uh, proper is Elbrus, Mount Elbrus, which I think is 18,000 feet. I, want, I can't remember how many meters that is, maybe 6,000 meters. Anyway, the short answer is no. I, I don't want to because... Really, I mean, South America, yeah, I would love to go up Aconcagua and a few other mountains, but climbing mountains is a really tough thing. And as you're getting older, it gets even harder. And Asia, forget it. It's like too many peaks up there that are way over 8,000 feet. There's 14 mm -hmm. peaks that are over 8,000 meters. Mm -hmm. And that is just, those. that's, so sorry, but no. <laughs> but I still love the mountains and I'd love to keep going, but. There's this guy I just uh, connected with, and I'm blanking on his name, but he's trying to do all the peaks in the Middle East. Okay. And he's Arabic himself, but yeah. he said half of the peaks he couldn't get to through for military reasons and uh -huh. all sorts of procedural issues and that kind of stuff. And those are just, that's sad headaches. I mean, we're very spoiled in, in the Western world where you can go up a peak for free mm -hmm. almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. And in much of the world, it's just not that simple. Mm. And uh, so maybe, maybe not climbing peaks, but uh, the, the the recent issue of the New Yorker has a uh, uh, a cartoon of two couples sitting on their their balcony, and then they're saying, "Okay, I, I've always wanted to pretend to want to hike the Appalachian Trail." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but I think a lot of people will be thinking, and I'll I'll, I'll put the, in the show notes your first book about hiking the, the Appalachian Trail. But I think people are thinking of different ways to travel that they haven't considered because they want to maintain social distancing or different, uh, yeah. you know, thoughts about remoteness. So speak about the Appalachian Trail experience. You've got a number of hikes uh, listed on your site, these long treks. Uh, what, what does it do for a person to go through this? Oh, I think it's it should be on everybody's list, a travel list, to go out uh, and do a long distance trail and long distance, you know, the Appalachian Trail is 2,000 miles, 3,000 kilometers. But I think something like that, something that takes you at least 10 days, maybe two weeks, um, that would be uh, a good, a good long trip, something that gets you out of your comfort zone. And so I just, I'm a big fan of going out of your comfort zone. And I think here's another reason why backpacking, and what I mean by backpacking, I mean wilderness backpacking, where you carry everything and you sleep outside. Mm hmm is so good for a traveler because once you get used to going for four days without a shower, 
once you get used to doing that and eating the same food every day and maybe really, and, or, or going, I went seven months without any cooked food. Think about that. I didn't even bring a stove, so I couldn't even boil wow. water. I walked from Mexico to Canada and back on the Continental Divide Trail. Mm. And when you get used to just sleeping on the snow by yourself with very little warmth, all that kind of stuff, and you're walking through mosquitoes, and then all of a sudden you get to West Africa and you're like, this is a piece of cake. I've got Larrikin, you know, I got a fan here, you know, I've got a mosquito net, <laughs> and uh, everything just becomes so much more manageable. If all of a sudden you go into a guest house and they say, well, we don't have anything, you can just sleep on the floor. I'm like, sleep on the floor? I'm used to sleeping on the mud. This is great, you know. So it just lowers your standard of living so low, and and assuming you can adjust to that, and that's the big if. Then suddenly the world becomes so much more easier to deal with, and everything becomes you. You become less of a materialist, mm. and you 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 acquire less things because all of a sudden, when you've got to put everything on your back, then then that just you realize i don't want to carry that much stuff in your back and that becomes metaphorical thing you just mm. don't want to have too many things you don't want to have two cars and, and a mortgage and maybe 10 couch you know couch and all this stuff just simplify your life and and that i think is the beautiful lesson of backpacking so many wonderful things can come out of that so i urge everybody who's watching this to go out there and you know put yourself out of your comfort zone and get out and spend some time in the wilderness and it's going to do you some good and those uh, 10 to 14 day experience, uh, th there's iconic hikes or treks in the world. And of course, you could make your trek just about anywhere. Are there, uh, just, just pick some of the continents you visited. What are some places that you would suggest as, again, it doesn't need to be a famous one, but just where somebody would just park their car and uh, go trekking for two weeks that you think would be the kind of one you would sign up for? Yeah, so there's I think there's such a wonderful variety of things. Like, for example, I wrote, if you Google El Camino Santiago, I don't know if it's still true. I used to be number one or number two on Google when you just mm. look for El Camino Santiago. But now I think the you know so many people hate my article. Uh, it's called 10 Reasons Why El Camino de Santiago Sucks. Um, and, <laughs> and that just created a firestorm. It's got 2 million views or something like that, maybe 3 million. I can't remember. It's got at least 2 million views. A very popular article and what and the most misunderstood article I've probably ever written because I also say 10 benefits. And so mm. I'll start with that. Mm -hmm. El Camino de Santiago de Compostela is a very traffic route. But for mm. somebody who's listening to this and say, Francis, there's no way that I'm going to go a single day without a shower, a hot, nice, warm shower. So mm -hmm. screw you. I'm like, OK, <laughs> go on El Camino de Santiago. That is your trail. Or okay. another person who says, there's no way I don't want to go around with a, with a nice hot meal. I want to end the meal with a nice steak or a nice paella or something like that. That's going to great. El Camino Santiago is perfect for you. Uh, you want to sleep in a bed. You want to sleep, whatever. It's a cushy trail and yet it's challenging and you can make it as long as you want. You can make it a hundred kilometers. You can make it a thousand kilometers. It's whatever distance you feel like it's wonderful. The only downside, and that's the 10 reasons why it sucks, um, is I just felt there's just so many people and it just felt there was like a little zoo there. So, but you can kind of get around that by going a little bit off season, you know, going in the, maybe the winter, if you can deal with that or other, t or, or at least some of the, the less popular times of year or take a less popular route and, and you can kind of minimize that. But that's certainly one uh, trail and the same, and the Appalachian Trail is also a very, a relatively cushy trail, even though it's a hard trail. And then the Pacific Crest Trail is great. As far as other countries, you could, the sky's the limit. You can really just make up a trail anywhere you want. And there's a lot of, you know, people, some people go around, uh, uh, blanking on the name in, uh, the Himalayas, they go around, oh, starts with an A, Anaconda. It's like Annapurna Seeker or something. Annapurna, yeah. Annapurna Circuit. Yeah. Thank you. So I haven't done that. So, um, but some people rave about that or people go up to base camp of Everest, but I'm sure it's a zoo as well. But, you know, there's a reason things are zoos because they're like, if they're amazing places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paris is great. <laughs> That's why so many people go there. <laughs> You've got a new podcast series that uh, I'm putting the links in as well, Wander, Learn, and you say, which is about a living a meaningful life. And it, it's an eclectic uh, range of topics from what might call pure travel to Bitcoin and all kinds of <laughs> things. It's, uh, how does all of this meld together into, into the meaningful life <laughs> for you? Yeah, that's true. Um, so I, I guess... I called it wander learn because I think that we wander the 
when we wander, we learn a lot. And I think travel is the best university that is out there. I was fortunate enough to go to Harvard University, but I've learned a lot more going on these travel trips. And that's where I think I've really educated myself. So I think that, and I like to keep the, the subject of the podcast very broad. Mm -hmm. And so I've talked to, I've had a controversial podcast series where I interviewed three different hunters and, and discussed hunting. And I'm like a quasi vegan, but mm -hmm. you know, I brought up the subject uh, because I thought, you know, this is an interesting topic. Uh, Rejoice and I, my wife, sometimes have recently debated and talked on the podcast about uh, race relations in America and the whole George Floyd uh, saga. And so, uh, so yes, I've kind of had some, it's not all about travel for sure, but I think the idea is to wander and stretch your, yourself mentally and talk mm -hmm. with people and talk about subjects that maybe are either uncomfortable or different or off the beaten path or whatever, just to get people mixed up. Bitcoin is another thing. It's just like something like, what the hell, Bitcoin? And so I just went off on a tangent and did a couple of podcast episodes about that. So uh, because I do think it's going to be a transformative uh, thing, just in the same way that credit cards or ATMs transform travel in a, mm -hmm. in a similar way. So, you know, I just thought, hey, let's cover this topic. A lot of people have questions about it. So, yeah, that's it. I was interested in your discussion with Rick about uh, pivoting from. Uh, you may have thoughts. You, you had your you had your corporate business career, and then you become a a writer, and and that's probably one path you had in mind. And now writers are expected to be their promotion agent, or expected to have you know five different social media accounts, YouTube, and all that. And I can see uh, certainly I see in myself. I'm like I just don't want to learn another social media platform and that. But but <laughs> you are learning. You're experimenting. What uh, what works with with staying true to yourself and what what have you found is just not worth the time and and don't bother. Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> I just no. I I tried very briefly, but I mean, it's just like anyway. But no, I mean, it's true. It's 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 a delicate balance because it's it's and you know this probably better than anybody. I mean. The, the most popular bloggers, travel bloggers out there, I get a feeling like they don't go actually anywhere mm -hmm. <laughs> because they got to pump out so much content and they got to stay online so much. Mm -hmm. It's, it's terrible. And then, or even when they do travel, it's so much like selfie, 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 you know, stuff like that all the time. And like, let me, so you're not in the moment, you're not paying attention to what's around you or talking with the the locals and it's tough uh because on the other hand i don't compl i don't blame these travel bloggers for being selfie sluts and 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 doing all these and getting on all these social media because it's hard to make a living otherwise so they either have to do that or they have to go back on their corporate job and work maybe six months or seven months a year mm -hmm. in a normal job save up money and do what so many other travelers have to do or or just go on these one month vacations and that kind of stuff. So they're like, okay, either I go on one month vacations every 12 months or I become a social media slut and I just go out there and just like promote. And and for them, that's the lesser of two evils. What are your thoughts on video? I mean, there's in, in so many creative industries, the talk is everything is video, video, video. And, and I think even more than a camera, it's it's so intrusive to a travel experience that it it uh, I just I've I've always intended to try to figure out something with video and I've never never made it work. How how are you approaching it? How do you think you can have you know non gimmicky meaningful travel video? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I filmed throughout my travel in Africa. My mm -hmm. hope was to then convert that into a television series or at least a video series of some sort. So I still have the content. I haven't cut it all. I did a trailer. I did a Kickstarter project, which raised about $23,000. And that was for the pilot episode. I spent it all. I didn't get a dime myself, but I had to hire editors and colorists and uh, music and all stuff. stuff. It's a really wonderful episode on Morocco. I did that in the hope that it would kickstart the television series. I could say mm -hmm. to the TV producers, voila, here is a fully produced pilot episode, 45 minutes long, ready for television. You can insert the ads in here. It's all great, but it's tough. It's really hard. Mm -hmm. And so it's, 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 it's very challenging to make a video for travel. And so that's why I think the travel channel is all about ghosts nowadays and haunted houses and things like that. <laughs> I just like, 
WTF? I mean, I just don't understand it, but it's because travel doesn't sell and it just doesn't bring the advertisers and nobody cares. And, and so many videos are just promotional and stuff like that. So it's, it's difficult. I do think, and, and meanwhile, you're combating this whole thing that the attention spans of people are, are in some ways seem to be shrinking in some ways because you're going to TikTok, you know, just things that are just super short, uh, Instagram videos, which are, are, are very short. So if you want to have a long form kind of video, first of all, it's very expensive and tough to produce. Um, and second of all, nobody's going to watch it. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's, uh, it's very, you know, I've seen some videos that are travel videos that are really, really well done. And they're like 45 minute things and they get like 500 views and some mm -hmm. jerk just films his cat taking a piss somewhere and it gets a million views. It's just, I don't get it. So, uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Video is a challenge. It's a lot of work, a lot more work than podcasts, by the way. If you just want to do an audio only thing, mm -hmm. that's easy. Um, but video, it brings a whole new dimension. And there's, there's this kind of video that we're doing right now, which is just talking heads. But then there's the video where you're adding B-roll and all sorts of other video yeah. on top of it. Yeah. And then graphics. My God, you can really, you can spend hours and hours and hours just doing a, a one minute video. Mm -hmm. and 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 if you and it's tough and then you got to do it all for almost free and people say oh yeah but there's these youtube stars that they make like a hundred thousand dollars a year or more i'm like yes but you know how many people how how many followers they have to do and how much it's just crazy it's a it's very 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 hard to make money so those of you guys listening to this thing and you <laughs> like what stefan's doing send the bastard some money because <laughs> he needs it because he's not making any money this is, I'm not and just give me a 10% commission on that. Or... <laughs> Actually, what we're uh, part of, I mean, this has just been an experiment because I've, I've listened to podcasts. I don't know. I went back to the earliest ones I saved were like 2005. And I kept saying, I don't understand. I, I, I listen to so many, but I have no understanding how to make this an actual business or something viable beyond a, a time suck. And uh, so we are, we are at least through the group putting together a YouTube channel where it's, uh, not just these interviews, but multiple people. So you're not sucked into that uh, every day. Uh, one person trying to have content. And then if it, if it slowly uh, has some monetization potential, then, you know, that each person could get a little cut of what their video sees. And that as a way that not intending to, or not expecting to be some, some giant uh, windfall, you know, like these, these viral stars, but it's something that, that could give people a little reward and a little encouragement. I, I think in, in the blogging, I mean, it's, it's, it's not just the, the part about, uh, you know, not necessarily making money. It's also about, you know, if nobody sees something you've labored over so much, that can be as crushing as not, not making the money. So at least, at least getting some, some thoughtful eyeballs on something can be useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also regurgitating uh, for, uh, content. So in other words, taking a, this, let's say this video here, and then just making a snippet, grabbing a two minute interesting part of it, or one minute, and then just putting that on things, you know, that's recycling content in some ways, and putting in different formats that could be useful, or maybe throwing on some B-roll in certain sections, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's all work. It's all work. And it's jack nothing, zero for pay. Um, so it's very tough. And I think a lot of people who don't create content and most, most of us really don't, um, really underappreciate how much effort people make like you. Then let's, let's close with why, why you keep doing it and, and how you'll uh, shape your, your next region and project. Because I'm an idiot. That's why <laughs> I'm a complete idiot. I haven't learned. <laughs> <laughs> You've at least learned. I mean, so your next region that's going to be the Pacific is, is, uh, is the idea or Asia? It's West and Central Asia. Now, I like to say West Asia because when people say Asian nowadays, nobody thinks of, you know, like I had great Asian food. Oh, yeah, what kind of food was it? It was from Iran. Mm. And they're like, what? Yeah. what? Yeah, it was, oh, I, I met this Asian today. Oh, yeah, where was he from? He was from Israel. <laughs> Well, I remember one listening to was he was uh, he like a Chinese guy from his, who lives in Israel? Yeah. No, he's a Jewish guy. Is he's like an Israeli? <laughs> I remember and he's Asian. To uh, our BBC Asia report, and it was all about India and, and Pakistan. And I thought, yeah, not at all what I thought was going to be on there. But right, <laughs> right, 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 right. That that is interesting. That's an excellent point because the Brits do often throw uh, India and Pakistan with Asia, but certainly almost nobody 
throws in Azerbaijan or whatever, or, or what's it called? Uh, all the stans, you know, Kazakhstan, that's in Asia, huh? Don't know how. Anyway, so yeah, so West and Central Asia, which includes all the stans all the way out to Israel and, and maybe Cyprus, which I guess is sufficient in Europe, I'm not sure. But anyway, that whole region, Turkey is in Asia. Um, and so that's that part, the Gulf states. And I want to spend about a year um, traveling there, roughly in total. And then after that, do East Asia, which is what the rest of the world knows as Asia. <laughs> um, I mean, by the way, I have the same beef with Americans because it's just like we, 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 we've, we've, we've usurped and grabbed this term, America. Mm -hmm. And yet America should refer to all the people from the Americas. Yeah, it's, yeah. And, and, it's, and yet it only refers to just one country. I really think we should not call us Americans. We should call us Yankees or Yanks. Mm. And that would then allow us to use the term Americas for mm -hmm. the entire two continents. You know, somebody from uh, Venezuela is American. Uh, somebody from Argentina is American. Somebody people from Paraguay, uh, Paraguay, yeah, American. So anyway, sorry, I went off on a tangent there. <laughs> so in this in this trip, it's going to be more condensed time wise. A year in these countries. Uh, what, what is your routine thinking about there is an end product, whether it's book, video, this. So what will be your routine for gathering material uh, broadly? Yeah, I, I will get a, I'm going to invest in a new camera. So I want to get a, like a, it's kind of like a DSLR, but it's a mirrorless camera that I, I want the new Sony one that hasn't even been announced yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I've got my eyes set on that. So that there's a tremendous utility in having a small camera. So I had a big camera. I had a camera about this. I can't even do it like this big. Um, and when I was in Africa and the problem when you take these kind of professional looking cameras is that it raises all sorts of questions and eyeballs. You can't walk into a museum without getting clearance and on and on. You're professional. And the stupid thing is that my silly little cell phone took things at 4k video at 4k and the big camera was only doing it that regular HD. Yeah. And so I was actually getting higher resolution from my little phone camera, but I could bring that in. So anyway, uh, that's why I want a more stealthy camera and just film people on the way and then take notes every day and, and, you know, just record, uh, conversations, maybe, uh, audio recording for podcasts. It's just gather information. That's what I do. I just love hanging out with people, couch surfing and just meeting as many people as I can to try to understand that's my thing i some people are foodies some people are monument people some people are nature people i guess the number one reason i love to travel is trying to know the nuances and the little differences between different countries and cultures and even within a country so like what's how is an iranian different from somebody from iraq hmm. how uh, how are you know people from saudi arabia are different from people from bahrain in, and like, do they like each other? What's their food different like? And just every, all the little nuances, that's what I love digging into. So then I will just probe and ask lots of questions to the locals to try to get that and then put it all into a book and, and see, and see, and, and get all the people who are, get angry at me for generalizing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, you, you can get all his generalizations about, uh, about Europe. I put, I, I put the, uh, I, I put the books in uh, in the links. They're available uh, Amazon un, Unlimited as well. Uh, so if you're an Amazon Unlimited subscriber, you can download those immediately right now. Otherwise, uh, multiple formats available for purchase. And uh, we're looking forward to Africa coming out in published form and uh, setting you off on your next trip as, as soon as the world opens up for you in some format. Inshallah. Thank you for joining us, Francis. Thank you, Stefan. It was a pleasure.